Lemot. Tih, lemot. Jadi profilnya kok enggak dimainkan? Gimana, Bapak? Jadi profilnya kok enggak dimainkan? Tapi itu sponsor. Jelas, Pak Faisal. Enggak bisa diapa-apain. Video profilnya kok enggak dimainkan sampai nunggu. Iya, Pak. Hidupan, hidupan, hidupan. Hidupan. Ini kalian posisi di mana, guys? <laughs> Hei, ini posisinya di mana kalian? Ke ruang dosen aja, biar nggak nyendat-nyendat. Saya di Bondowoso, Pak. Yang di kampus, siapa yang di kampus? Ke ruang dosen aja. Ruang dosen aja, biar nggak nyendat-nyendat. Pak, ini pemateri sudah mau masuk, Pak. Ya, nggak apa-apa. Tapi video profilnya Prodi dimainkan biar nggak sekosongan gini. Biar sambil lihat-lihat. Iya, Pak. Pak Faisal izin menjawab. Ini anak-anak ada di kelas B202 ya. Kemarin tak tanya ini tanya di kelas. Nyendat-nyendat gitu di kelas. Kalau enggak nyendat-nyendat ya enggak apa-apa. Tadi katanya putus-putus, lemot. Ayo dimainkan dulu itunya apa videonya sebelum orangnya saya suruh saya, saya masukkan.
Gak ada suaranya, Boy. Ada, ada, tapi kecil. Berbekal semangat Edge Language Morality, para kesatria Airlangga di ujung timur Jawa Dwi Pabayuwangi ini juga ditempah dengan kesempatan dan fasilitas belajar yang setara kampus utama Unair di Surabaya. Sikia Banyuwangi mengembang misi UNAIR menjadi Center of Excellence, diwujudkan melalui pencapaian tujuan yang dilaksanakan secara sungguh-sungguh dengan jiwa dan semangat Excellence with Morality. Indonesia memiliki potensi perikanan yang melimpah mulai dari perikanan tangkap dan budidaya. Namun seiring dengan berkembangnya kebutuhan manusia akan protein hewani yang hanya mengandalkan alam saja tentu belum cukup. Sehingga budidaya perikanan diterapkan untuk mendukung dan memenuhi kebutuhan konsumen mulai dari lokal hingga internasional. Budidaya perikanan atau aquaculture sendiri merupakan rekayasa lingkungan untuk biota yang dirancang sedemikian rupa hingga menyerupai lingkungan alaminya. Lulusan aquakultur dapat menjadi teknisi budidaya, supervisor, konsultan, QC, tenaga pendidik, tenaga peneliti, LSM, wirausaha, dan lain sebagainya. Nah, tunggu apa lagi? Mari bergabung bersama kami. Indonesia memiliki potensi perikanan yang melimpah mulai dari perikanan tangkap dan budidaya. Namun, seiring dengan berkembangnya kebutuhan manusia akan protein hewani yang hanya mengandalkan alam saja tentu belum cukup. Sehingga budidaya perikanan diterapkan untuk mendukung dan memenuhi kebutuhan konsumen mulai dari lokal hingga internasional. Budidaya perikanan atau aquaculture sendiri merupakan rekayasa lingkungan untuk biota yang dirancang sedemikian rupa hingga menyerupai lingkungan alaminya. Program studi 
di Aquakultur, Sekolah Ilmu Kesehatan dan Ilmu Alam Universitas Airlangga di Banyuwangi mempelajari banyak hal terkait perikanan budidaya, baik budidaya. budidaya air tawar, air payau, maupun air laut. Selain itu, program studi ini juga mempelajari terkait manajemen kesehatan ikan, nutrisi ikan, genetika, dan rekayasa genetika ikan, serta aquascape ikan hias air tawar maupun air laut. Kuliah di jurusan aquacultur sangat cocok untuk kamu yang suka jalan-jalan dan juga bekerja terlapang. Karena selain kita belajar di kelas, laboratorium, kita juga berkesempatan untuk mengunjungi balai perikanan, pantai, pembudaya, dan juga tempat-tempat perikanan lainnya. Mahasiswa apa kultur telah banyak mengungkit prestasi di berbagai ajang lomba, baik tingkat nasional maupun tingkat internasional. Selain itu, mahasiswa juga mendapatkan kesempatan untuk study exchange ke luar negeri. Menjadi mahasiswa akuakultur, kalian juga akan mendapatkan kesempatan untuk meraih berbagai jenis beasiswa. Lulusan akuakultur dapat menjadi teknisi budidaya, supervisor, konsultan, QC, tenaga pendidik, tenaga peneliti, LSM, wirausaha, dan lain sebagainya. Tunggu apa lagi? Mari bergabung bersama kami. Indonesia memiliki potensi perikanan yang melimpah, mulai dari perikanan tangkap dan budidaya. Namun, seiring dengan berkembangnya kebutuhan manusia akan protein hewani, yang hanya mengandalkan alam saja tentu belum cukup. Sehingga budidaya perikanan diterapkan untuk mendukung dan memenuhi kebutuhan konsumen, mulai dari lokal hingga internasional. Budidaya perikanan atau aquaculture sendiri merupakan rekayasa lingkungan untuk biota yang dirancang sedemikian rupa hingga menyerupai lingkungan alaminya. Studi Aquakultur, Sekolah Ilmu Kesehatan dan Ilmu Alam Universitas Airlangga di Banyuwangi mempelajari banyak hal terkait perikanan budidaya, baik budidaya air tawar, air payau, maupun air laut. Selain itu, program studi ini juga mempelajari terkait manajemen kesehatan ikan, nutrisi ikan, genetika, dan rekayasa genetika ikan, serta aquascape ikan hias air tawar maupun air laut. Aquakultur sangat cocok untuk kamu yang suka jalan-jalan dan juga bekerja terlapang. Karena selain kita belajar di kelas, laboratorium, kita juga berkesempatan untuk mengunjungi balai perikanan, pantai, pembudidaya, dan juga tempat-tempat perikanan lainnya. Mahasiswa Aquakultur telah banyak mengungkit prestasi di berbagai ajang lomba, baik tingkat nasional maupun tingkat internasional. Selain itu, mahasiswa juga mendapatkan kesempatan untuk study exchange ke luar negeri. Selama menjadi mahasiswa Aquakultur, kalian juga akan mendapatkan kesempatan untuk meraih berbagai jenis beasiswa. Lulusan aquacultur dapat menjadi teknisi budidaya, supervisor, konsultan, QC, tenaga pendidik, tenaga peneliti, LSM, wirausaha, dan lain sebagainya. Nah, tunggu apa lagi? Mari bergabung bersama kami. Indonesia memiliki potensi perikanan yang melimpah, mulai dari perikanan tangkap dan budidaya. Namun, seiring dengan berkembangnya kebutuhan manusia akan protein hewani, yang hanya mengandalkan alam saja tentu belum cukup. Sehingga budidaya perikanan diterapkan untuk mendukung dan memenuhi kebutuhan konsumen, mulai dari lokal hingga internasional. 
Budidaya perikanan atau akuakultur sendiri merupakan rekayasa lingkungan untuk biota yang dirancang sedemikian rupa hingga menyerupai lingkungan alaminya. Program Studi Aquaculture Sekolah Ilmu Kesehatan dan Ilmu Alam Universitas Airlangga di Banyuwangi mempelajari banyak hal terkait perikanan budidaya, baik budidaya air tawar, air payau, maupun air laut. Selain itu, program studi ini juga mempelajari terkait manajemen kesehatan ikan, nutrisi ikan, genetika, dan rekayasa genetika ikan, serta aquascape ikan hias air tawar maupun air laut. Aquakultur sangat cocok untuk kamu yang suka jalan-jalan dan juga berkegiatan lapang. Karena selain kita belajar di kelas, laboratorium, kita juga berkesempatan untuk mengunjungi balai perikanan, pantai, pembudidaya, dan juga tempat-tempat perikanan lainnya. Mahasiswa Aquakultur telah banyak mengukir prestasi di berbagai ajang lomba, baik tingkat nasional maupun tingkat internasional. Selain itu, mahasiswa juga mendapatkan kesempatan untuk study exchange ke luar negeri. Selama menjadi mahasiswa Aquakultur, kalian juga akan mendapatkan kesempatan untuk meraih berbagai jenis beasiswa. Lulusan aquaculture dapat menjadi teknisi budidaya, supervisor, konsultan, QC, tenaga pendidik, tenaga peneliti, LSM, wirausaha, dan lain sebagainya. Nah, tunggu apa lagi? Mari bergabung bersama kami. Indonesia memiliki potensi perikanan yang melimpah mulai dari perikanan tangkap dan budidaya. Namun, seiring dengan berkembangnya kebutuhan manusia akan protein hewani, yang hanya mengandalkan alam saja tentu belum cukup. Sehingga budidaya perikanan diterapkan untuk mendukung dan memenuhi kebutuhan konsumen, mulai dari lokal hingga internasional. Budidaya perikanan atau aquaculture sendiri merupakan rekayasa lingkungan untuk biota yang dirancang sedemikian rupa hingga menyerupai lingkungan alaminya. Program Studi Aquakultur Sekolah Ilmu Kesehatan dan Ilmu Alam Universitas Airlangga di Banyuwangi mempelajari banyak hal terkait perikanan budidaya, baik budidaya air tawar, air payau, maupun air laut. Selain itu, program studi ini juga mempelajari terkait manajemen kesehatan ikan, nutrisi ikan, genetika, dan rekayasa genetika ikan, serta aquascape ikan hias air tawar maupun air laut. Aquakultur sangat cocok untuk kamu yang suka jalan-jalan dan juga berkegiatan lapang. Karena selain kita belajar di kelas, laboratorium, kita juga berkesempatan untuk mengunjungi balai perikanan, pantai, pembudidaya, dan juga tempat-tempat perikanan lainnya. Mahasiswa Aquakultur telah banyak mengukir prestasi di berbagai ajang lomba, baik tingkat nasional maupun tingkat internasional. Selain itu, mahasiswa juga mendapatkan kesempatan untuk study exchange ke luar negeri. Selama menjadi mahasiswa Aquakultur, kalian juga akan mendapatkan kesempatan untuk meraih berbagai jenis beasiswa. Lulusan aquaculture dapat menjadi teknisi budidaya, supervisor, konsultan, QC, tenaga pendidik, tenaga peneliti, LSM, wirausaha, dan lain sebagainya. Nah, tunggu apa lagi? Mari bergabung bersama kami. Indonesia memiliki potensi perikanan yang melimpah mulai dari perikanan tangkap dan budidaya. Namun, seiring dengan berkembangnya kebutuhan manusia akan protein hewani, yang hanya mengandalkan alam saja tentu belum cukup. Sehingga budidaya perikanan diterapkan untuk mendukung dan memenuhi kebutuhan konsumen, mulai dari lokal hingga internasional. 
Budidaya perikanan atau aquaculture sendiri merupakan rekayasa lingkungan untuk biota yang dirancang sedemikian rupa hingga menyerupai lingkungan alaminya. Program Studi Aquaculture Sekolah Ilmu Kesehatan dan Ilmu Alam Universitas Air Langga di Banyuwangi mempelajari banyak hal terkait perikanan budidaya, baik budidaya air tawar, air payau, maupun air laut. Selain itu, program studi ini juga mempelajari terkait manajemen kesehatan ikan, nutrisi ikan, genetika, dan rekayasa genetika ikan, serta aquascape ikan hias air tawar maupun air laut. yang suka jalan-jalan dan juga berjalan lapang karena selain kita belajar di kelas laboratorium, kita juga berkesempatan untuk mengunjungi balai perikanan pantai, pembudaya, dan juga tempat-tempat perikanan lain Mahasiswa Aquakultur telah banyak mengukir prestasi di berbagai ajang lomba baik tingkat nasional maupun tingkat internasional selain itu, mahasiswa juga mendapatkan kesempatan untuk study exchange ke luar negeri Selama menjadi mahasiswa aquakultur, kalian juga akan mendapatkan kesempatan untuk meraih berbagai jenis beasiswa. Lulusan aquakultur dapat menjadi teknisi budidaya, supervisor, konsultan, QC, tenaga pendidik, tenaga peneliti, LSM, wirausaha, dan lain sebagainya. Tunggu apa lagi? Mari bergabung bersama kami. Indonesia memiliki potensi perikanan yang melimpah, mulai dari perikanan tangkap dan budidaya. Namun, seiring dengan berkembangnya kebutuhan manusia akan protein hewani, yang hanya mengandalkan alam saja tentu belum cukup. Sehingga budidaya perikanan diterapkan untuk mendukung dan memenuhi kebutuhan konsumen, mulai dari lokal hingga internasional. Budidaya perikanan atau aquaculture sendiri merupakan rekayasa lingkungan untuk biota yang dirancang sedemikian rupa hingga menyerupai lingkungan alaminya. Studi Aquakultur Sekolah Ilmu Kesehatan dan Ilmu Alam Universitas Air Langga di Banyuwangi mempelajari banyak hal terkait perikanan budidaya, baik budidaya air tawar, air payau, maupun air laut. Selain itu, program studi ini juga mempelajari terkait manajemen kesehatan ikan, nutrisi ikan, genetika, dan rekayasa genetika ikan, serta aquascape ikan hias air tawar maupun air laut. Aquakultur sangat cocok untuk kamu yang suka jalan-jalan dan juga bekerja tanpa Karena selain kita belajar di kelas, laboratorium, kita juga berkesempatan untuk mengunjungi balai perikanan, pantai, pembudidaya, dan juga tempat-tempat perikanan lain. Mahasiswa Aquakultur telah banyak mengukir prestasi di berbagai ajang lomba, baik tingkat nasional maupun tingkat internasional. Selain itu, mahasiswa juga mendapatkan kesempatan untuk study exchange ke luar negeri. Selama menjadi mahasiswa Aquakultur, kalian juga akan mendapatkan kesempatan untuk meraih berbagai jenis beasiswa. Lulusan aquakultur dapat menjadi teknisi budidaya, supervisor, konsultan, QC, tenaga pendidik, tenaga peneliti, LSM, wirausaha, dan lain sebagainya. Nah, tunggu apa lagi? Mari bergabung bersama kami. Indonesia memiliki potensi perikanan yang melimpah, mulai dari perikanan tangkap dan budidaya. Namun, seiring dengan berkembangnya kebutuhan manusia akan protein hewani, yang hanya mengandalkan alam saja tentu belum cukup. Sehingga budidaya perikanan diterapkan untuk mendukung dan memenuhi kebutuhan konsumen, mulai dari lokal hingga internasional. 
Budidaya perikanan atau aquaculture sendiri merupakan rekayasa lingkungan untuk biota yang dirancang sedemikian rupa hingga menyerupai lingkungan alaminya. Program Studi Aquaculture Sekolah Ilmu Kesehatan dan Ilmu Alam Universitas Airlangga di Banyuwangi mempelajari banyak hal terkait perikanan budidaya, baik budidaya air tawar, air payau, maupun air laut. Selain itu, program studi ini juga mempelajari terkait manajemen kesehatan ikan, nutrisi ikan, genetika, dan rekayasa genetika ikan, serta aquascape ikan hias air tawar maupun air laut. Aquaculture sangat cocok untuk kamu yang suka jalan-jalan dan juga berkegiatan lapang. Karena selain kita belajar di kelas, laboratorium, kita juga berkesempatan untuk menghubungi balai perikanan, pantai, pembudidaya, dan juga tempat-tempat perikanan lain. Mahasiswa Aquaculture telah banyak mengukir prestasi di berbagai ajang lomba, baik tingkat nasional maupun tingkat internasional. Selain itu, mahasiswa juga mendapatkan kesempatan untuk study exchange ke luar negeri. Selama menjadi mahasiswa Aquaculture, kalian juga akan mendapatkan kesempatan untuk meraih berbagai jenis beasiswa. Lulusan aquaculture dapat menjadi teknisi budidaya, supervisor, konsultan, QC, tenaga pendidik, tenaga peneliti, LSM, wirausaha, dan lain sebagainya. Nah, tunggu apa lagi? Mari bergabung bersama kami. Uh, hello, uh, can you hear my voice clearly, all the participants? Yes, okay. Okay, thank you, Mr. Faisal. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Respectable Dr. Nur Hidayah Mohtaufik as senior lecturer at University of Malaya, Honorable Mr. Damamastia Budi, SPI MSI, as study program coordinator of aquaculture, School of Health and Natural Science, Ilangga University, honorable the lecturers of aquaculture, School of Health and Natural Science, Ilangga University, honorable all the participants and all the invited guests. In the name of Allah, the most gracious and the most merciful, all praises belong to Allah, the Lord of Universe, no God but Him. All praises and salutation be open to our beloved Prophet of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who has brought us from the darkness era to the lightness one. All praises and safety be open to his family, companion, and those who follow his step to spread out the ideology of Islam until the end of the world, the day of judgment, and the day of hereafter. Good morning, everyone. My name is Arthur. It is an awesome and precious chance for me to be your master of ceremony in this morning on Friday, 25th of November, 2022, in our big event, Aquaculture Guest Lecture Program, Black Soldier Fly Larvae as an Ingredients for Aquafit. Excellences, ladies and gentlemen, before we start our agenda for today, let's pray based on our belief. Pray, begin. Pray could be done. Well, ladies and gentlemen, now we will start our session, guest lecture program, Black Soldier Fly Larvae as an ingredient for Aquafit. We would like to welcome Mr. Muhammad Faisal Ulhaq, SPA MSE, as our moderator. Before that, let me introduce Mr. Faisal Ulhaq. Mr. Faisal Ulhaq is a lecturer of aquaculture School of Health and Natural Science, Ilanga University. His educational backgrounds are bachelor's degree at Ilanga University and master's degree at IPB University. Okay, Mr. Faisal, time is yours. Okay, thank you. Uh, is my sound is clear? Yes, Mr. Very clear. Okay, uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. 
Good morning, everyone. Today is a nice day because we will learn about viral topic in fish feed aquaculture technology, especially the new source that have high potency to substitute the fish meal with black soldier larvae or BSF meal, or in Indonesia, we familiar called maggot. <clears throat> My name is Muhammad Faisal Haq. It's my pleasure to be a moderator for this session. First of all, I would like to thank our honorable keynote speaker, Dr. Nur Hidayah binti Muhammad Taufik. Good morning, Dr. Nur Hidayah. Good morning. Okay, Good thank morning. you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you too. As well as all of audience for joining this class. The topic of this morning is black soldier fly larvae as an ingredient for aqua feed. <clears throat> Before we listen to the presentation for, from keynote speaker, may I briefly introduce to you our speaker today. <clears throat> Dr. Nur Hidayah binti Muhammad Taufik is a senior lecturer at the Institute of Biological Science, Faculty of Science, University Malaya. She graduated as a doctor of philosophy from the same university in 2017 with the specialization in aquaculture nutrition research. Her, re her current research interest is the utilization of local renewable resources from animal feeds such as insect meal, especially in black soldier fly larvae. Beside this, she has uh, got several awards from 2010 until 2022, and many articles, it's almost 15, 50 articles, have been published and cited in several high reputation journals, proceeding book chapter and mass media. Her latest study has been published and titled Bioconversion of Desiccated Coconut and Soybean Curd residues for enhanced black soldier fly larvae biomass as a circular bioeconomic approach in was and biomass valorization journal. After that, a lot of her research project with funding from several resources from 2019 until 2022. She also have a speaker experiences as invited oral and keynote in national and international conference from 2009 until 2021. And a lot of her experiences is in administrative duties, teaching activities, supervision, and many more. Wow, it's a very a lot experiences. So this season is divided into two parts. The first part is the presentation from Dr. Nohidaya for 90 minutes and continuing with discussion part until 10, 30 minutes. For all participants, please mute your speaker during this presentation from Keynote. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big round of applause to invite Dr. Nur Hidayah. Time is yours. Okay, uh, I just would like to ask if you can see my screen. Yes, it's yes. very clear. Yeah. All right. Okay, so um, first of all, thank you very much to uh, Mr. Faisal for the introduction. And I would also like to uh, thank Universitas Ailanga for inviting me as a as a invited speaker for uh, in this Friday morning. Um, I am thankful for the invitation, and I believe um, 
Universitas Ailanga has a very extensive program of aquaculture. And, um, and me as well, I, I'm actually uh, from Institute of Biological Sciences, Faculty of Science, uh, University Malaya. I'm a senior lecturer. So basically, my um, work revolved around animal nutrition. Uh, but I was actually trained as an aquaculture nutritionist during my PhD in, in, in UM as well. So uh, right now, I'm also working with other uh, animals like poultry and also uh, currently with rabbits. Uh, but my major interest is actually on aquaculture. And um, besides my work, I also have a social impact project called Fisher Lover. So you can uh, find my social media on Facebook, YouTube, uh, and so on. Uh, so basically, my, my lab is called uh, Aqua, Aqua Nutri Biotech Research Laboratory and it's located in University Malaya, Kuala Lumpur. Yes. So um, today I was given a topic about uh, black soldier fly, which is a very interesting topic for me. Um, I believe this is a time, timely topic with our current uh, condition today with the uncertain, uncertainty of um, feed price, the food and feed security, and also because of the global warming and climate change. So this insect is currently um, very viral, I believe as well in Indonesia. Uh, in Malaysia, we call it uh, lalat askar hitam, black soldier fly, but most, uh, mostly we call it BSF, okay? uh, black soldier fly. And this black soldier fly has been hyped as a alternative feed for not only fish, uh, aquaculture, but also other animals. Um, so when we look at feed production, we cannot, uh, we have to look at the why we, we need to look at the feed production. Before that, we have to look at the human population. So human population is expected to increase, it's projected to increase um, up to 9 billion people in 2050 and um, believe it or not we just passed the 8 billion number this past uh, week yeah and uh, it's expected to increase over the time uh, and as we can see from from UN project projection here from UN projection here um, Indonesia is going to have like projected to increase up to 330 million people in 2050. While the world, in the world, we will have 9.74 billion people in 2050. So of course, can we cope with this kind of situation with the increased human population and yet our resources is shrinking? Can we sustain um, the livelihood of, of these people to feed all these people? sustainably. So there's a lot of questions um, being prompted with regards to this increasing human population. And one of it is the feed security, which is how are, we, how are we going to feed our animals with the current condition of increasing human population? Therefore, we need to look at broader perspective okay, of um, food production. So uh, in United Nations have, have um, projected 17 SDG goals. I believe um, everybody is looking forward to um, create impact by using these SDG goals. And um, food production, including fish is focus is one of the focus from this uh, SDG goals. And in order to improve our food uh, due to this growing demand, we have to improve the way we produce our food. 
right to outcome um and the outcome of this 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 method the fish for example it has to be um it need to have wide range of nutrients micronutrients and also macronutrients it's not just macronutrients the proteins but also we are we are looking at micronutrients as well so that people will have um, nutritious food and to produce sustainable production of food particularly fish right now we have different uh, different uh, there are two ways conventional ways uh, which is fisheries and also aquaculture so in order for us to produce a sustainable production of food we should we should have a sweet spot in between the social um, economic and also environmental so these sweet spots of uh, in between these three main aspects will actually produce a sustainable products. Okay, um, so uh, this is one of an uh, interesting comic strip that I normally, I actually normally use in my class. So um, this comic strip is, is from 2009. And if you can see, um, the figure, the picture on the left, okay, with the teen guy, the captain with the captain um, cap. Okay, this guy, they uh, have a very big, I believe is tuna fish from 1959. And today, what, what we can capture in from the marine is, is like the small fish. And Therefore, we have to ask ourselves, right? How can our grandparents, you know, uh, harvest this big fish? While we can, we it's hard. It's hardly we we hardly see this this kind of big fish today. And um, catching big fish those days is very easy. There's abundance of fish, and sometimes they are humongous. So um, I will go back to this image later at the end of my presentation. So just bear with me and just remember this image okay i will uh, i will share why this is important for us for our uh, future aquaculture development okay let's focus back to the topic all right so when talking about aquaculture uh, looking at the uh, latest latest uh, sources from fao the the sofia fao uh, reports, we can see that Indonesia is in the second place um, for algae production and third place for aquatic animals, which is uh, behind, only behind China and India. So you see that Indonesia is the top three countries that produce this protein source, especially seafood. Um, and this is why I would say Indonesia is a very important uh, producer, provider for human uh, for protein for human consumption. Yeah, and and how how do we what makes this this development so profound? So how does aquaculture industry really really increase over the past decades? So there are several factors that contribute to this growth of aquaculture. And I, I, I've aligned these four factors here. The first one is vaccines to control diseases. So if you can see that most of our uh, production of fish culture or shrimp culture is intensive. Intensive culture, that means free, uh, fish are prone to um, stress and then this stress will lead to disease. And with the introduction of vaccines, this actually control, could control or improve the, the disease situation for aquaculture. And we also have improved strains. And um, this is also very important. We, we want to make sure the strains of uh, animals that we grow is, is better okay, uh, for future. And also government policies, we cannot, we cannot deny the government policies also 
is very important in uh, modernizing aquaculture. And most important, importantly, they are better fit. So over the time, we have uh, improved the fit production and um, there are a lot of nutritional requirement research available for the past 50 years. And all these nutrition studies actually um, historically from uh, John Halvers, the father, of, the father of fish nutrition. During his time, there's a lot of nutritionists and then uh, a lot of nutritional requirement studies available that could contribute to this better performance of feed over the time. So what, what did we do for the past 50 to 70 years? Okay, so if you can see this image here, it's just a very uh, simple, simple, boring bits, dark, sometimes colored, uh, sinking or sometimes floating. So it's a fish feet here. So looking, looking at this fish feet, it looks can be deceiving. So, but to achieve this, this stage of feet, there's a lot of industries, there's a lot of um, work have been carried out to, to, in, to um, produce this feed. There's a lot of studies have been going on to improve this, this feed. And there's a connection of several industries as well uh, when, when we talk about feed production, from the milling, from the reduction fisheries, from the rendering, from the oil processing, and a lot of other industries. So the process for to produce this type of feed is not easy, it's complicated. Especially when we talk about aquaculture and we have a lot of uh, commercial fish, almost 200 commercial fish, and each of them have their own nutritional requirements. So each fish, each, each, uh, every fish doesn't have the same nutritional requirements. So there's a lot of things uh, need to be done in order they have sufficient nutrients for them to grow optimally in aquaculture, in aquaculture, yeah? And so we also need to, uh, because of this uh, feed, we have, a lot of ingredients that we have been studying in order to produce this type of feed. And most of the, most of the time, fish meal, fish meal, soybean, corn, are those ingredients that are very uh, well known and very important in, in aqua feed. Without these ingredients, we cannot have this, this sort of uh, big cooperation of uh, feed production. So over the time, because of this um, dominating fish meal, soybean and corn, it's, it's getting uh, unsustainable over the time. So that's why we need to recognize alternative feed, alternative feed source available today, including insects meal. So um, like it or not, human population is increasing, as I've mentioned earlier. And we human, we are still omnivorous. Yeah, we, we still eat meat. Therefore, uh, seafood is still on the table. And we cannot just rely on uh, fisheries to supply our source of seafood. So we need to have farm animals. So these farm animals need to be supplied with feed not made from uh, not made for human consumption so as best as possible we need to reduce or limit the amount of ingredients that we use for human consumption for example soybean corn uh, as well and uh, focus on ingredients that is not being used for human consumption so um, by minimizing the use of human food as animal ingredient, we could have a sustainable feed. So that's why it is important for us to recognize these alternative feed resources um, to be able to have this sustainable uh, growth and sustainable feed production in the future. And uh, 
what the, the major feed that we are using right now, as I've mentioned earlier, is fish meal and fish oil. And this fish meal and fish oil are important source of protein and lipid uh, for animal, not only for aqua feed, but also for other farm animals. So um, most of us talk about fish meal and fish oil. We need to replace them uh, as protein and lipid source. Lipid source. Um, but uh, the other reason is because they have protein and lipid are not the only reason we, we need to replace them. The other reason is because they have all these essential uh, micronutrients required by the fish to grow healthy and happy. So in order for us to search for an alternative ingredients, they sh we should have, uh, the ingredient should have a complete um, macro and micronutrients uh, to be able for, for the fish to be able to accept them. So, Currently, there are uh, four types of, of uh, ingredients used in aqua feed. So some are better, better in, in many ways, depending on the species fat. So we have plant proteins here. We have oil seeds, cereals, pulses, uh, this uh, soybeans, uh, corn are in these categories. We have uh, vertebrates proteins, uh, including poultry byproducts, feather meal, blood meal. And then uh, we have a single cell protein here. Uh, microorganisms, we are talking about microorganisms uh, from fungi, yeast, algae, bacteria. And finally, we have the invertebrates protein here. So uh, black soldier fly or is considered under invertebrates protein. Um, it is a very, since black soldier fly is an insect or animals, so it's very near to fish meal uh, as a replacement. So what are the factors for alternative ingredients? So looking at the alternative feed ingredients, there's a lot of factors that we need to consider. Yeah, it's not just um, the, the nutritional profile, but also this, all these factors from the cost. Okay, we, we don't want the, the ingredients to be very expensive. And we need to be able to culture them and culture them sustainably, growing them in a very sustainable manner. Uh, besides that, it has to be palatable to the species of interest. So we cannot just simply um, give any type of feed, but the fish did, will, not be, will not accept them. So it has to be palatable to the, to the, to the species of uh, interest. Uh, and uh, it should have continuous supplies, abundance of supplies. Um, local supply is possible. So nowadays we are talking about local resources instead of imported, um, imported ingredients. So we want to be able to produce our own feed and our own food. Um, of course, the composition and the quality, the nutritional profiles, um, the inclusion rates, we have to make sure how much, uh, what's the percentage, how much can we include in the diet formulation. We cannot just simply include everything. It might be hazardous for the animals. So we have to test this, the inclusion rates. And then, uh, of course, the performance of the, the ingredients, the digestibility, the anti-nutritional factors, whether it does have on the it does um, have effect on the palate quality and the final feed, um, the end products. That means the end products of the animals. Uh, if we can, we can uh, look at the fillet quality, the sensory analysis. Uh, of course, the storage durability. We have to make sure the ingredients can be stored in um, not really. Uh, inexpensive storage okay uh, and it can the shelf life is long so that it won't be um, 
it, it will it will last long in order for us to use in the in the uh, for the feed production and also of course the pollution is free so it has to be uh, free from uh, any chemicals or toxic okay, free from um, hazards so these are some of the factors that we have to consider when looking at the uh, ingredients okay due to this reason as Part of my research, I've, I've been working with insects uh, in animal uh, actually for the past 10 years, I would say, since my PhD. So, um, so far, there are two insects that I've been working with. Uh, crickets, okay? uh, my PhD work is mostly on crickets and also uh, black switcher flies. So crickets, uh, when I'm doing... Uh, Cricket is actually uh, right now is mostly used for human consumption. So the, the, the manufacturing of crickets nowadays are more focused for uh, human food rather than um, animal feed because of the, the, the cost, because of the um, production, the rearing, um, the different uh, way of rearing substrates used it's mostly suited for human consumption, um, human, for human uh, food. Uh, but black soldier fly, uh, mealworm is mostly used for, for animal feed. Um, so insects is actually has been used for food in many countries. Um, in Asian, within Asian region, there's few countries that use or consume insects as part of their dietary regimes as their protein sources. Um, but in, in, in my country, in Malaysia, it's not, it's not our norm to consume insects. So uh, what we can do is use these insects as uh, animal feed. So that's where my research coming in. And um, so today, a lot of my research uh, is more concentrated on, on black soldier fly as animal feed. And um, I've been working with few companies, I would say, industries um, to formulate uh, feed for, their, for, the, for the industries. So it's for fish and also for poultry feed. And a lot of industries now, nowadays growing uh, and popping up, popping up uh, all over the world uh, related to insects, especially black soldier flies. And um, yeah, so before we talk about black soldier fly, I would just like to introduce a little bit about what this, this creature is. So um, for me, I would say that this insect is the little army of waste management. So why I, I would say little army of waste management? Because of this black soldier fly, they are great in upcycling uh, food waste into premium insects protein. So that's why we can say that these insects can transform waste to worth. So instead of we, we dump all this waste to the landfill, we use this waste as a feed for this um, insects, for this black soldier fly. And this black soldier fly will produce, will grow, and their biomass is very nutritious, high quality of protein. And it's not just for insects feed. They can be used for other products. There's a lot of other products coming out from black soldier fly nowadays. But most importantly today, uh, we've been using this black soldier fly for feet. And I would say for uh, pet industries, is currently dominating uh, when we talk about uh, black soldier fly, uh, black soldier fly as protein source. Um, and if you go to research or to um, journals, you can see that there's a lot of tests have been a lot of analysis, a lot of research is being uh, conducted to, to test this black soldier fly as feed for not only fish, but also for poultry, pig, and also rabbits. Yeah. 
And so uh, here are some of the industries, big industries, I would say. Uh, we have very uh, small, uh, small industries, uh, small scale farmers who grow BSF in, in a lot of uh, places. Uh, in Malaysia, we have a lot of, a lot of um, farmers growing BSF just to feed their, their uh, animals in the farm. Uh, but, all, but we also have a large manufacturer. So these are manufacturers um, associated with uh, black soldier fly uh, production in Asia. So this was, um, I, uh, I got these uh, industries from AFIA, Asian Food and Fit Association. Um, it's sources from 2020. So uh, over, I think now there's more than 300 to 500 companies, I would say. Um, that has been growing to produce feed for animals. So it's not necessarily um, black soldier fly, but we also have other types of uh, insects like crickets, mealworm uh, to be used as feed and also for other types of products. So, but most of the, mostly this, this uh, industries, they use black soldier fly uh, for animal feed. So why this, this insect is very special? So this insect is, um, they can be grown in a very short cycle. So most of the time, uh, they, they actually live for 45 days only, 45 to 50 days, depending on what substrate or what kind of uh, food that we supply to them. And um, so we have several stages okay, for black soldier fly from the eggs um, to the uh, neonates. So once the eggs have hatched, uh, we call it neonates. So these neonates uh, is about the, the uh, cycle is about around five to six days. And after that, they become larvae. So during this stage, we feed them the substrates or the organic waste that we have. And then, um, and then uh, we have pre-pupa. So after a certain time, after 15 days, they will turn into pre-pupa. Uh, during the pre-pupa stage, their, their colors become darker. And um, after that, okay, they will be pupa. So during this pupa stage, they will not eat anything. They will just hibernate. Uh, and after that, around after 10 days, um, they will uh, change into, emerge into adults. So the adults will then um, mate and produce eggs. So as you can see here, that there are a lot of different stages and each stage have their own products. We can produce something from each stage. So, um, of course, from the uh, eggs, we will, uh, will have uh, larvae. So this larvae can be used for various purpose. So uh, here we talk about animal feed, but we can also um, extract the oil from the black soldier fly. So depending on the substrates that we give them, if, we, if the substrate is high in fat content, we can extract the oil back from the black soldier fly and use that for other purpose. So there are studies on um, black soldier fly oil being used for their biodiesel, um, biogas. And also um, the larvae, once we harvest them, they will leave some residues. These residues are the, their, their waste uh, and we call it fresh. So this press can be used for uh, fertilizer. So fertilizer is there are there are a lot of um, demand right now for black soldier fly fresh because they say that it's a very good type of fertilizer for crops for growing crops. And yeah, so here we have like three products already from this larva larvae stage, 
And um, some of the farmers even feed fresh black soldier fly fresh to their farm animals, for, uh, particularly fish and also chicken. But in order for us to um, store them in a longer period, we have to process them. So we can dry them and uh, produce, uh, process them and turn into black, black soldier fly meal, BSF meal. And so they can be stored in a longer time. And um, so if, if uh, we extend their uh, lifespan, so they will grow into uh, pre-pupa and pupa stage. So some industries like um, the swiftlet birds, okay, the swiftlet birds, they like to buy this, uh, this pupa stage because um, the birds will, um, will catch the adults. So they will put this pupa, once the pupa emerge into adult stage, these birds will feast on this adult's BSF. So, it, uh, so they will feast on the adult's BSF. So that's why the swiftless, swiftless industries like to buy the pupa stage. Okay, so uh, once they grow into adult stage and then they will uh, produce eggs, they will lay eggs and the cycle will start all over again. So these black soldier fly, they can consume any type of organic waste so far, um, but there's a lot of research on different types of substrates being given to the black soldier fly and see which type of substrates are better for their growth and better for the output products that we want. Okay, um, so this is a picture of um, black soldier fly OV position. So during the X production, okay, the mating process, um, the adults will mate, okay, how they mate, the, uh, the male and female will line up on opposite sides with their tails connected. So uh, in order for us to differentiate between male and female, sorry, I don't have the picture here. Male will have um, a tail like an open flower, while female will have a tail like a, a scissor shape. So they will attract to each other. And uh, finally, the female will then deposit eggs. Um, they will find gaps small gaps. So we use um, uh, wood stack. Okay, they will deposit their eggs, lay eggs in between these, these gaps here. And some, some, some farmers, they use cardboards, cardboards here. So they will find a very small um, gaps in order for them to um, lay their eggs, okay, to deposit their eggs. So this is actually uh, on the on the left side here is actually my first uh, I would say cage uh, mating cage, and it's not a very good cage I would say because uh, we just use these mosquito nets and it's easily torn out, and um, and sometimes the the BSF just lay eggs anywhere they want they just find these small gaps so they just lay eggs there. And um, over the time, we uh, upgrade our cage and then we put um, our egg traps here and also some substrates to attract them to lay eggs where we want. Okay, so this is uh, just a small scale of production of BSF here in our lab. Um, this is the eggs production of BSF in farms. Uh, this picture that this is. Um, one kilo of eggs actually. Um, one kilo of eggs here can be produced per day in this in this farm that I visited in Johor, uh, Malaysia. Just to show you the picture. Um, so for black soldier fly rearing, there's a lot of different method to rear this this uh, uh this larvae. So uh, right now we have um just used small beans, these manual beans, we just put the substrates inside and then the larvae will grow in. So over the time, we just um, 
add more substrates uh, into the beans. So they will be here for um, 13 to 15 days, depending on what we fed them. But in the industry, they, al they already have um, automated, you know, automated system where they have a lot of these types of uh, creators to put all these uh, larvae. And um, in Malaysia, we have a few um, companies who, who use this automated system to uh, produce black soldier fly. Uh, so they use uh, less labor instead. So using these beans is still quite laborious. So that's why um, it, we need to have more people to work with, to work uh, for, uh, for the manual uh, type, of, type of system. But for the automated system, it's already, we can use, uh, reduce the number of staff here. But instead, we produce a um, higher amount of uh, black soldier fly. So this is the uh, larvae processing. Um, um, so for industries, there are several process uh, needed in order for us to, to get the optimum products, to get the optimum uh, larvae uh, to the, to the uh, in, uh, industries. So the first one is we need to sort out the waste. So this black soldier fly, they, they eat their products, their nutritional content will depends on what we feed them. So if we have a lot of waste, we have to figure out what kind of waste we are using to feed them. And a um, lot of the time, people just feed them food waste, a uh, mixture of food waste, right? Mixture of food waste from the restaurants, from the household waste, um, where there's a lot of different types of um, waste there. So how are we going to process it? So that uh, should be in the pre-processing um, pre stage here. So before we rear them in the, in the uh, lava rearing system, we have to figure out how are we going to process it? What are the substrates that we need to ensure that our larvae grow um, in standard, in, in a similar stage? So we don't want different stage in, in one culture. Okay, so that's why uh, the use of single substrates is actually favorable in industries. So um, the rearing process is here. We can have different types of rearing systems nowadays. There's a lot of um, BSF culture with different types of system. So we can just choose according to, to the availability, according to our space, according to our area, according to the output that we want, and according to the um, budget that we have. So um, this larvae rearing is, is in the treatments here. And then after that, we have to harvest them. So harvest, harvesting require uh, sieving. So uh, when we have this black soldier fly with substrates together in one beans, so they will, they will be mixed with the substrates. So we need to be able to sieve them. Okay, so uh, during the product harvesting, this is when we separate the black soldier fly and the, and the substrates. So the substrates can be, can be, um, can be sell as the fresh, so the substrate. The, this is the, uh, the waste from the black soldier fly. So the residue are the waste from the black soldier fly and we can uh, sell them as the fresh. So, and then the larvae will be, um, process. This is the larvae refining stage uh, so for the post-processing. So there's a lot of um, areas have been uh, it has, has been um, studied here during the post-processing whether we want to um, extract the oil, we want to mix the larvae with a certain nutrients, whether we want to um, dry them, how, how are you going to dry them? Okay, there's different way of drying method for black switcher fly and so on. 
So post-processing is also a very important uh, stage before it can go to the uh, products, okay, before, before it can go to the uh, fish feed pro, uh, uh, manufacturer. So um, when we talk about any types of ingredients, including uh, black soldier fly, there's different, um, I've listed here uh, nine, nine types of benefits, uh, benefits or parameters that we look at uh, when we study black soldier fly. So of course, we have to look at the digestibility, okay, the growth performance, um, the liver functions. So the liver functions are very important in order for, for us to understand um, their health. Okay, uh, and then the Im immune parameters, um, the antioxidant enzymes, the um, serum or the blood, uh, biochemical composition, the intestinal health, the gene expression, and also blood parameters. If you look at any aquaculture-related studies, especially with regards to uh, fish nutrition, you can see all these um, parameters being uh, conducted, being um, studied, well studied. And for BSF, there's a lot of papers coming up every day, in, in fact, every day uh, with regards to um, black soldier fly feed, uh, black soldier fly as aqua feed. And a lot of these factors have been um, being well studied for black soldier fly. So um, I would just like to highlight a few of our lab um, study or papers with regards to um, black soldier fly. And so this is actually the latest uh, papers that we publish uh, this year on July. So we actually look at um, the effect of different agro waste. Uh, this agro waste is abundant in Malaysia. So we, we look at uh, soybean curd residue or what we call in Malay, hampa soya, and also uh, desiccated coconut. Uh, desiccated coconut is hampas clapper. So this um, agro waste is a lot and uh, it's been dumped. Although some use that for um, directly for animal feed, but it's not as, uh, the value added is not very high if you just use them directly. So uh, what we do is we test these products for uh, black soldier fly substrates, and uh, we look at how BSF can valorize this and turn into this waste into high value products, which is black soldier fly meal. And so we monitor the impact of this uh, waste on growth, uh, nutrient composition, um, the fresh composition, and also the waste reduction efficiency. And um, based on this, uh, the paper, based on the research that we found, so um, we have different types of uh, substrates here. T1 is actually uh, more on uh, desiccated coconut, 100% desiccated coconut, while um, T5 is 100% soybean curd residue. So T2, T3, T4 is, is just... Um, a different ratio of um, this desiccated DCR and, and SCR in, in the substrate. So what we find is um, black soldier fly grown uh, or fed with soybean curd residue or T5 has actually better performance in terms of the growth, um, the waste reduction efficiency, um, and also um, the, the nutritional profile. And if you look at the picture here, since this uh, black soldier fly has, uh, this T5 has been fed with um, this uh, soybean curd residue, SCR, they actually turn into pre-pupa faster than the other groups. So that's why uh, they grow fast. So when they grow fast, they turn into pre-pupa faster. So that is actually a good indicator that this uh, soybean curd residue can be used for uh, black soldier fly substrates instead of just being dumped or just directly being 
used for animal feed. Because these black soldier fly, they have much more nutrient, uh, nutrient uh, profile compared to the um, SCR alone. So um, based on the proximal analysis of this, this dried larvae, we can see that uh, those in uh, this BSF actually have different protein and lipid range. So those who are fed with uh, soybean curd residue or T5, they have better protein range, okay, better protein range compared to those in um, T1, they have better lipid range. So depending on what type of um, output that we want, so if we want to have a better protein output, for example, for, for uh, animal feed, for fish feed, we can supply this BSF with this um, soybean, soybean curd residue. So this is uh, waste from the soybean industries. And if we want to have more oil for the product, biodiesel, for example, we can feed them with this uh, coconut residue. Yeah, so um, it depends on the outputs. Okay. And uh, when we compare uh, the, the fresh, the fresh content or the content of um, the residue left uh, from the BSF, we found that all the parameters is actually um, higher than the commercial organic fertilizer, except for the nitrogen. So, and um, N, nitrogen and phosphorus content is actually higher in T5, while the rest, uh, T1 has higher uh, potassium, calcium, and magnesium content. Yeah, so um, I would say this is comparable to, to the organic fertilizer. And, um, this okay, so this is just to show you the differences between um, defatted and uh, full fatted and partially defatted uh, black soldier fly. So if you can see from um, the the table on the left, so this is a uh, full fat black soldier fly, meaning we don't we don't extract the oil. So when we don't extract the oil, the crude protein content is actually around thirty five percent. Um, and this is from, from uh, Rowski at all 2020. Um, and uh, you can see the fat content is around 30%. Okay? But if we try to defat them, okay, the, the protein content can reach up to 65%. Yeah. And the eater extract can reduce. To 46 gram per kg of 4.6. So uh, this shows that if we if we extract the oil, we can increase the protein content in the black soldier fly larva meal. So this is actually uh, one way the industry the industries has been doing right now in order for them to get higher protein content. They at another pre uh, post processing uh, method, which is oil extraction, so that the protein content of the black soldier fly is higher and is comparable to fish meal. Yeah. And here I would just like to uh, show you there's various research available nowadays. Uh, if you go to, um, if you Google, it's in the Google Scholar, you can see a lot of. Um, different black soldier fly papers coming out and um, different nutritional profile as well. So as I've mentioned earlier, the, the uh, nutritional pro profile is depending on what we feed them as well as the amino acid uh, percentage. So depending on what we feed them, we would get different uh, nutritional profile. So this is a, a good way to um, control what are the output that we want, okay, how much protein content or lipid content that we want or energy content uh, that we want, and we can try to get the suitable substrates for that matter. And this is actually um, our first paper from the lab, I would say, uh, from uh, in 2016. 
So we tested, uh, this is the initial um, project. We tested uh, black soldier fly and give them to uh, null tilapia. And then um, we measure the growth performance and so on. Uh, however, during this time, we find that we don't defect the, the, the black soldier fly. So we have quite high, high concentration of lipid here. It's around 28%. And so the lipid content is, is quite high during this time. And uh, however, during in this paper, we find that uh, those fed with 50% replacement. So we, we replace 50, uh, 25 up to 75% of fish meal with, with black soldier fly. And we find that um, around 50% replacement could give benefits effect to this tilapia. And uh, if we increase too much, if we replace 100% of black soldier fly with uh, if we replace 100% fish meal with black soldier fly, we would see a low growth performance because of the chitin. And um, this chitin from this insect is, is one of a problem. So it will affect the digestibility of the fish. Um, so uh, we also have uh, published uh, in, in uh, Journal of Insects and Food and Feet um in 2020 on uh black soldier fly grown on different substrates and then we fed them to red hybrid tilapia we would just want to see whether is there any impact of the substrate that we feed them towards the growth of the fish and certainly they are okay and um, in this paper we feed the uh, the black soldier fly with um, uh, palm oil, decanter cake, and also coconut, coconut pulp or the coconut residue. And um, this is the nutritional composition of this, this black soldier fly, uh, uh, this black soldier fly, and then the substrates that we feed them. So you notice that the substrates has a very low nutritional profile. It's only 0.69 protein and once we feed them to the black soldier fly, we could increase their value instead of just use them directly. So we could um, improve the, the value rather uh, when we look at crude protein and crude lipid here. Yeah. And so when we test it on fish, we find that, um, okay, sorry, this is first the, the growth of black soldier fly. Uh, we, find, we found uh, a good growth, okay? um, constant growth from week one to week five, and the weight actually increased five times uh, for, uh, for this uh, CP group, five times. Uh, and then uh, for the DC group, it's only for, uh, four times. So it shows that there are increasing of increasing of growth, and uh, but however we can see a slight dip here in in the in week four, possibly uh, due to the molting process. And so uh, we supply them to the tilapia, and um, we found that fish supplied with BSF fed with decanter cake produce. Uh, better growth performance and uh, feed efficiency. Uh, and then uh, fish supplied with coconut pulp produce higher lipid content than other diets. So, so yeah, so uh, it, it still have different impact when we look at this, this uh, different uh, substrates. Okay, and uh, yeah, so this is another paper, another paper um, for pre pupa oil. So we have another paper uh, published in 2020 about um, oil. We extract the oil from black soldier fly and we um, supply them to the tilapia. And uh, we uh, observe 
the uh, fatty acid content. So based on our, our study and based on other study as well, other research, BSF is actually rich in lauric acid, uh, oleic acid, and also uh, linoleic acid. Okay. Um, however, they are very poor in terms of PUFA content. So they still cannot, cannot um, replace fish oil because their entry and six uh, entry especially is uh, omega-3 is actually very low compared to the fish milk, uh, fish oil, sorry. But they have a good profile of lauric acid, oleic acid, and linoleic acid. And so um, this is uh, papers uh, related to lauric acid. So because of this um, high presence of lauric acid in BSF oil, there are various studies conducted um, to test what can we do with this lauric acid? What can we, how this lauric acid can, can this lauric acid improve um, the fish performance? So based on uh, 2008 papers, uh, they tested insects-based diet in lauric acid actually can reduce liver lipids in freshwater Atlantic salmon. So uh, it's a good, it's a good uh, indicator that this oil can reduce um, effect on uh, fish liver. Uh, this is another uh, promising um, alternative strategy to an antibiotics. Uh, so lauric acid is actually can be used to, to uh, improve immune, immune response of fish. And uh, so that's why it has been used uh, and it has been studied to, to uh, challenge this fish with um, other uh, bacteria, for example, um, and to prove that they have promising uh, alter antibiotics, alternative for antibiotics. So, and lauric acid is actually a main source uh, that we can find in, in, in coconut and palm oil. And now we can find it in BSF. Um, other than lauric acid, there are also um, other compounds, which is called antimicrobial anti peptides. So antimicrobial peptides is also uh, one of the compounds that very widely studied, uh, coming from the exotic fly. And um, this antimicrobial peptide actually is a web defense weapon uh, for innate immune response for fish. And it has, it has been labeled as um, altered, harmless alternative to antibiotics. So it can actually protect this fish against uh, infectious disease. Um, other than antimicrobial peptides, chitin is also part of um, compounds that could improve uh, fish immunity as well. But we cannot include chitin in, in the diet too much because it will impact the digestibility of the fish. Uh, and uh, we also can find a lot of um, challenge project or disease project, disease resistance um, studies with regards to uh, Hermitia illusions of black soldier fly. And this is one study, uh, it found that 5% five, 5 of uh, HI or uh, black soldier fly or uh, Hermitia illusions can increase antioxidant activities in liver and reduce aromonitiability colonization in the spleen and protect this large mouth best from bacterial infection. So um, from this result, they suggest that 5% of uh, black soldier fly can be substituted, can be included in the diet to replace uh, fish meal to uh, increase the disease resistance. Yeah, so I'm coming towards the end of my presentation. So if you look at this picture here, I hope you can gather some um, info or some hint based on the picture here 
uh, we can see that um, this phenomenon is actually happened happen already. Okay, the climate change, the global warming, the overfishing of fish. So what happened is during those days, we have been um, bombarded with information that we have to fish larger fish instead of smaller fish, right? So we leave the smaller fish in the ocean and let them reproduce and up until certain age, certain uh, weight, we can harvest them. But it's actually create a huge impact on the fish size over the time. So as we, as we know, uh, I'm not sure if you know, older fish is actually have higher fecundity rates compared to a uh, smaller fish. So when we give, when we fish the older fish over the time, only smaller fish left in the ocean. So over the time, the fish getting smaller and smaller. And uh, because they have to reproduce early, they have to uh, mate early in their life, lifetime. So they won't be able to get bigger or uh, yeah, their size will, will just shrink over the time. So this is why overfishing is, is not is, uh, limited right now. So right now we still have fisheries, but we are um, managing the fish stock so that there will be no overfishing as what happened for the past few decades. And so in order for us to trade, trade, off, trade off for the human population, growing human population, and managing our uh, wild fishery stock, we have to make sure that we have sufficient alternative ingredients to provide our aquaculture fish. We cannot just rely on the wild fish uh, stock for the production of our aquaculture fish. So it's not going to be sustainable. And so um, that is why, um, studies related to alternative feed ingredients like these insects has to be um, well, well established in order for us to grow our industries, our feed industries in a sustainable manner. Okay, so um, uh, with that, I, I uh, end my, my lecture for today. So if you would like to contact me, you can email me and you can also go to my uh, website here. You can just uh, Google UM Expert to see um, my work and also other uh, websites from Google Scholar, Pablons, uh, Scopus and so on. So um, yeah, I think uh, that that is basically um, small lecture, I would say, about Black Soldier Fly. I hope everybody could gain something out of this lecture. Uh, and yeah, feel free to ask any questions. Uh, if I can manage to answer, I will answer as, as uh, what I can answer based on my understanding and based on my current knowledge. So yeah, thank you very much for listening. Um, yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, thank you. Dr. Noridaya, that was an excellent presentation. And now we are going to the next session, which is discussion. <clears throat> As I mentioned below, you can raise your hand to directly ask to Dr. Noridaya, or you can write your question in the text box. <clears throat> and I will ask to the uh, speaker. The first question, it's uh, from, okay, uh, the student <clears throat> have a question to the Dr. Nordidaya. Okay, uh, <clears throat> there is the first question from Mr. Dharmawan Setiabudi. Uh, nice presentation from Dr. Noridaya. I would like to ask, what are the weaknesses of PSF larvae as a, lar as a raw material for fish feed? And why is the level of PSFL meal that is too high is not too good for tilapia feed? <clears throat> uh, 
test the BSFL stadia or its effect the nutrient content. Please, Dr. Norida, ya. Yeah. Okay. So, um, thank you for the questions. A very nice question. Good question. So, basically, um, weakness of BSF, I would say, uh, based on our understanding, is the chitin content. Because uh, during the stage of, between each stage of larvae, they will um, change their, uh, you know, they will change and then they will uh, grow. So during this growth process, there will be um, chitin. So BSF is actually um, insects. So chitin is part of their uh, insects cuticle. So uh, this chitin can, can affect the digestibility of fish if it's too much in the diet. So that's why um, we cannot put like 100% of black soldier fly in the diets because it will uh, retard the growth of fish. Um, yeah. So normally, uh, a lot of studies, probably less than 50%, um, in the diet to replace fish meal, I would say to replace fish meal, depending on how much fish meal you have in the diet. So the most I can I could say is 50%. Um, and yeah. And um be, and another another thing is that uh, when we talk to the industries right now, the production of black soja flour is is still fairly expensive uh, compared to fish meal. So the price actually affect um, this as well because it's still in small scale. Uh, it's not like large tonnage uh, yet. It's not like fish meal. So um, we still have limitation in terms of uh, price cost. Uh, this is based on, uh, I would say in, in Malaysia context, we still have uh, problems with price. So uh, that's why, now we are reducing, we have to reduce a little bit the amount compared to uh, fish meal. And uh, fish meal is actually the best, the best, uh, uh, the best ingredients for fish because fish eat fish. So they get the best nutrients from fish meal. So in order to replace fish meal 100% is totally um, hard, it's very hard because Another thing is amino acid. Amino, amino acid, the uh, limiting amino acid, if you know methionine and lysine, uh, limiting amino acid and can only be found in marine fish or marine organisms. So this is limited in black soldier fly as well. So that's why we still need to have fish meal um, in the diet. Um, does the BSL uh, stage or age affect the nutrient content? Yeah, I would say yes. Um, normally for the harvest, the, the larvae that we use for the black soja meal, uh, black soja fly meal, we use it around, after around 15 to 20 days before they grow into pre-pupa stage. So, uh, most of the industries, they don't want to, to extend up until pre-pupa stage because it's too long. So, before they turn into pre-pupa, we harvest them and if it's go go any we if we increase the age it will the nutrient profile will be lower than the larvae so um yeah so it's actually um affect the age is actually affected i hope i answer your question oh mr dermawan is the question uh, as from the answer from the is <clears throat> thank you it's very clear thank you uh, the next question is come from uh, Indra good morning Dr. Nuridaya I have a simple question for you is there any danger of cultivated this animal <clears throat> especially in PSF considering this animal are insect which if released into nature will be dangerous maybe some kind of population exploration of PSF itself. Thank you. Okay, um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, so basically, uh, in terms of danger, uh, I would just, 
a highlight here, like soldier fly, <clears throat> during their mobility stage, which is during their adult stage, they won't eat. They will just drink and mate for uh, around four to 10 days. Um, so during this stage, although they are mobile, they can fly around, so they don't eat. So they won't be able to <clears throat> transmit any diseases or any uh, virus to others. So that's why it is considered safe. However, there are studies or cases when um, <clears throat> those with honeybees, honeybees farm, um, they actually affected with black soja fly uh, colonies because um, when black soja fly colonies actually uh, suddenly appear in the, in the colony, it will affect the honeybee uh, performance. <clears throat> so this is actually um, relate to the cleanliness of the farm. So as, uh, as I've mentioned earlier, black soldier fly, they can um, eat, they can consume any types of organic waste. So if the farm of honeybees are dirty or contain any um, waste and it's been introduced to honeybees farm, it will uh, somehow it will get uh, infected, infested. So um, there are cases before uh, for honeybees. So if possible, uh, honeybees farmers, they should make sure that their farm are clean and not uh, bring in any pests. Uh, for example, uh, this black soldier fly, they can just fly around and then uh, lay their eggs anywhere. But in terms of disease, um, so far, there are no, no um, indicator that these uh, insects can, can transmit disease. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Noridaya. Um, the next question is from Mr. Darmawan again. Uh, is this recommend? Is this not recommended to use fresh PSL or wool PSL as a fish feed? Okay. Um. It, <clears throat> uh, if you know your type of fish, every fish have their own nutrition requirement, right? And black soja fly, they have it has their own uh, nutritional profile. So if we talk about uh, giving them directly the live feed, yes, you can, but they will not grow as optimum as pellet. Mm. So if we, if we include this BSF meal in the pellet, we can formulate the pellet according to the fish nutritional requirement. And so the fish will receive a good nutrients from the pellet uh, according to uh, what their requirement and this will satisfy them. But if we just give them this larvae live fresh, they will grow, but they will not be as good as uh, pellet fish. And then uh, one thing is you cannot store them uh, long. So after several days, they will just grow. And then, um, yeah, they will just grow. It's not... Uh, the shelf life is not long. So if you want to increase the shelf life, we harvest them, dry them, and, and process them into feed that is much more um, uh, better. It's, it's expensive, but in the long, long run, it will be much more better than, than just uh, give them directly. If you don't really, um, I would say, if you don't really uh, care about time frame, then yeah, go ahead and just give them uh, directly, it doesn't matter. Okay, there is more efficiency in uh, meal with, uh, compared with wool PSF. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I would say that. Okay, uh, any question? Again? Okay, during white, white, whiting, I, oh, okay, uh, Muhlis. Morning, Dr. Noridaya. I have a simple question for you. With highly valuable liquid on this PSF larvae, is it preferable to applicate this and 
this as additional feet or feces that having habitat at cold temperature just like Grammy? Um, yeah, I would I would agree with that because uh, fish in cold temperature they will require higher lipid content in their diet, so um, it would be good for for um, fish with um, high cold tolerance um, compared to to tropical fish, right? Tropical fish, uh, their lipid requirement is very low, so it's hard if we have very high lipid content in, in the BSF diet. So in order uh, for us to reduce that is either we give them substrates that have light, uh, low lipid content or we can um, defect, defect them, extract the oil. But uh, if we don't, if the fish require high lipid content, so we can just use directly the BSF with high full fat content. So it doesn't matter with that. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is from uh, Putri. Good morning, Dr. Noritaya. The existence of fish in the sea is currently less and less because of the many changes that occur from year to year. Therefore, the right solution is fish farming. Can alternative PSF feeds help improve the fish farming productivity? Okay. Um, yeah, so basically because of the increasing of uh, fish farming over the, over the years in all countries, including in, in Indonesia and also in, in Malaysia, so we have a lot of fish to feed. So in order for us to feed all these fish to, um, to the growing demand of human population, so we need to find um, some alternative, um, alternative feed, alternative ingredients. So we cannot just rely on the fish meal, uh, fish meal and also uh, soybean and corn uh, because it's not sustainable. So one of the ingredients that we are currently looking at is a uh, black soldier fly and it's actually have an impact on aquaculture farm. And there are already commercial feed made from black soldier fly available in the market nowadays. Um, although most of the current products actually um, are concentrated, a focus on pet industries, but over the time, if, if the pet industry is already uh, saturated with black soldier feet, we will have to move it to aquaculture feet um, because aquaculture is, is big, you know, it's a big industry. And in order for us to feed these animals, we need to have a lot, a lot of uh, black soldier fly. And at the moment, the production of black soldier fly still cannot cater all this. Um, uh, aqua, aquaculture uh, industries. So that's why the price is considered still premium right now. And that's why pet industries are uh, really into black soldier fly because they can pay much more higher price, you know, because pet industries are much more uh, premium industries. So, um, but if we have, if we, if we, um, over the time with the increasing of, of technologies, with the increasing of uh, with the up, uh, automated system, um, more and more people um, coming into the industries and um, you know, we, we can grow this black with your fly and then we, we could reduce the price and uh, it will be more, more com competitive, more competitive to the uh, uh, feed manufacturer so they would be able to include this black soldier fly in, in, in the fish diet. So that's the, the main aim right now in order to uh, increase, you know, the, the economies of scale, you know, to improve the economies of scale for the production of black soldier fly, we have to improve the technology. So once we improve the technology, we'll be able to reduce the price. Uh, it will be much more competitive in the future, I believe. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thank you, doctor. And the next question is from Alta. 
Yeah. I have some permission to ask why can the fatty acid content in PSF affect the fish liver? Okay. Um, so fatty acid content is related to lipid, yeah, to oil. So this actually will um will have some effect in the hepatic uh health, okay, the hepatic health of the fish. So somehow there are studies that lauric acid actually can improve the uh, hepatic or the liver condition of the fish because, because lauric acid is rich in black switcher fly and it actually influence um, the, 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 the fish um, liver, the fish liver health. Yeah, so... I would say there's a connection between fatty lauric acid and the fish liver health. So that's why it affects the fish liver. Hope I answer your question. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Cynthia. Good morning, Dr. Nidaya. Based on your presentation, PSF larvae content uh, lauric acid Antimicrobial, antimicrobial peptides and other components. So what kind of test and how its mechanism to determine the nutrient composition of PSF larvae? Okay, so um, the nutrient composition, uh, macronutrients and micronutrients, I would say the nutrient composition from the crude protein, crude lipid, um, ash, which, which relates to the minerals, uh, fiber, um, energy, and carbohydrates can be determined through um, AOAC. I'm not sure if you uh, if you um, familiar with AOAC. Uh, we have proximate composition for the crude protein using JDAL method, SOXLED method for crude lipid, uh, um, and ash, and different types of method to determine this uh, nutritional profile analysis. So uh, the BSF, they have, um, I would say, lauric acid antimicrobial peptides, that is uh, biological compounds associated with them um, that could improve immune response, that could uh, improve antioxidant uh, activities. However, this nutrient content similar as other ingredients if you want to uh, formulate, uh, if you want to in, in, include these ingredients in the formulation, you have to be able to know the nutrient profile, which include the crude protein, crude lipid, um, carbohydrate level, energy, and so on. So these uh, nutrients will influence um, the growth performance of the fish. So the growth and feed efficiency of the fish will be determined based on its, its, its nutri nutritional profile. So uh, we have to make sure that it's comparable to the uh, main protein source in the diet. So it can be so, uh, fish meal, it can be soybean, depending on uh, the ingredients that we input in the formulation. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And the next question is from Ahmad Ali and Raihan, I think. The two, the two question is the same. Uh, how to process PSF so that it doesn't lose nutrient and it's free from disease or bacteria? As, as we know that uh, PSF is stress. And I think the similar question from Raihan is what happened if we uh, consume the fish that had fit with PSF because uh, <clears throat> The BSF can also as a factor from several diseases. Okay, um, so that is why, uh, in order for us to make sure that the feed, the the feed fish that we uh, supply with BSF, the BSF must be supplied with substrates from clean waste. It's not. Um, dirty waste like feces, uh, you know, uh, animal feces or uh, waste with high toxic uh, chemical, uh, hazardous chemical. So we have to refrain ourselves from using those kind of waste 
and we have to make sure the wings that we gather for the black suture fly is is um although it's organic waste but it's not does not has any uh bacteria or, uh, or uh, chemical pollutants in it uh, so that's why in eu uh, in the europe in order for for them to use this bsf uh, larvae for their animals this bsf must be fed with not animal related waste so it has to be from plants or plants uh, related waste that's why uh, vegetable waste or fruits waste or agri waste those kind of waste are very suitable to be used for bsf farming in order for them to be to be to transfer to the fish so that we won't be able to when we when we eat the fish it's not trans transferable to us however there are studies when when we include um, chemicals or pesticides in the black switch of fly if if the pesticides is too high they will die they won't be able to survive so we have tested um, vegetable waste uh, with high concentration of pesticides. The BSF won't be able to live because it's too high. And, uh, and there are also studies, if we include the pesticides in, in the waste, is it transferable to the fish? And the answer is no. Somehow um, there are studies that this 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 um contaminants will not be transferable to the black soldier fly when they eat it but um there are further studies that we need to to do in order to make sure that it is very safe so in order for us to make sure that um the meal the bsf meal that we have include to input in the formula to include in the diet it has to be free from any contaminants free from any uh, bacteria or, or uh, those um, hazardous uh, pollutants. Yeah, so then only we can use them for the feed or for the fish. Yeah. Okay, thank you. It's, uh, it's depend from the uh, substrate, I think. Yeah. Because uh, the clean substrate, it's uh, produced the high the health of uh, PSF and also that not uh, contain a several toxic in the PSF. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Yosina. Uh, as we know, maybe we have different environmental condition between Malaysia and Indonesia. Is there any influences? from the environmental factor that have an impact on the growth of PSF, for example, its temperature, light, deafness, and its relations for us to cultivate PSF and the high lands that have low temperature or the place that, had, that has high temperature. Please, Dr. Noridaya. Okay. Um, yeah, certainly. I would say certainly um, they are... Uh, influence uh, in between environment on BSF production. So um, there are studies who mention that this BSF will not be able to uh, mate during the cold season. So that's why during the cold season we would be able we would see a drop of uh, egg production. So um, that's why uh, in countries not not from tropical countries, they would um, raise their BSF in the, in the room, in the temperature control room. So they would get the optimum production of black soldier fly. Because uh, in, in here in Malaysia, we rely on our climate, on our weather to raise this BSF because we have um, you know, a good climate. Um, we have warm climate and humidity that is necessity for this larvae to grow. Because this larvae need uh, require <clears throat> um, temperature around uh, 26 to 26 to 30 degrees Celsius for the for the larvae. 
So if it's too, too hot, they won't be able to survive. And if it's too cold, their development will be very, very slow. Yeah, I would say very slow. So um, I think in between Malaysia and Indonesia, depending on the location, it is not very, uh, very different. But if we talk about um, those in the temperate countries, yes, it would affect them because they, well, they have four seasons and everything. So uh, that's why a lot of uh, countries from, from, from the Europe's actually, they come here in, within the Asian countries to produce, uh, to uh, open their industries here. The big, big countries, they open the, in the, the BSF industries in within the Asian region because we have a good climate. We have a good humidity, temperature that is very um, suitable to grow uh, that soja fly in, in a very um, optimum time. So, um, yeah, so I would say um, it depends on the, on the industries as well. Some in a, a large, manufacture large industries, they would uh, invest in, in good facility for uh, producing and managing this black soldier fly in a good, uh, in an optimum way so that they would, they would get or produce this black soldier fly fast and good in within good quality. So that's why um, our region is a very good, uh, good region to raise this BSF. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any question again? Okay. Uh, Miss, uh, Mr. Ananda Wildan, raise your hand. You can uh, ask directly to the Dr. Noridaya. Okay. Thank you for paying the time, Mr. Faisal. So I would like to say thank you for Dr. Nur Hidayah for paying us the, uh, about this research about the BSF welfare. So I want to ask you some question about the effect of the lipid content of the BSF can be effective of the organic matter content of, uh, in the water quality. So this is my question. Thank you. Okay, if I can, um, I can... Repeat your question. Is is the lipid content from BSF will affect water quality? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, the quality of the water. Okay. Um, I would say that's why when we when we uh formulate the diet, we have to make sure we know what are the best lipid content for the fish. Yeah. So if the lipid content for the ingredients are too high, we cannot put too much in the diet. It will affect not only the fish, but also the water quality. So when the water quality is affected, it's uh, reducing. So it will affect the fish as well. So uh, that's why when, when uh, I'm not sure if, if you have given, you try to give the BSF, um, fresh BSF, um, how, how, what can you observe from the water quality? Is it different? Is it um, oily a little bit than the normal condition? Uh, because in, in our lab, we don't really uh, give them a very high lipid content diet. So we won't see the, the effect too much. But I would say if it's too much, if the, if the BSF has high lipid content, if you give them high fat content um, diet, it will certainly affect the larvae and um, it will be hard for you to use it in a formula, in the formulation. That's why most of the uh, industry or most of the research right now are trying to defat them or either or give them uh, substrates with less lipid content. Yeah, I hope I answer, I, I answer your questions. Thank you, Dr. Naridaya. I think it's the last question from Mrs. Habsa Dengan Jono Jati. Please directly ask to the Dr. Naridaya. Uh, 
Okay, thank you, Mr. Faisal. Um, Assalamualaikum, Dr. Nur Hidayah. Uh, nice to meet you here. Yeah, finally uh, we meeting. Yeah, thank you for accepting the invite invitation of the case lecture today. Uh, I appreciate with your uh, presentation. Uh, the presentation is very, very interesting um, about the black shorter lar fly larvae. Uh, I think I just have one question uh, for you uh, about the how uh, is there any technique uh, to dry the larvae uh, then uh, it, uh, uh, how to how to the how the technique to dry the larvae which can uh, destroy the nutrient content uh, for the larvae so it can use for fish feed okay yeah okay. thank you for the That's question all. yes Sorry. um so uh right now what I, I what based on what my my understanding based on uh my information gathered uh from the industries and from the research papers um uh, most of the industries they already they uh already adopted microwave uh type of drying um rather than oven drying so and the temperature the temperature of the the drying is also also plays important role to ensure that the nutrients are not uh destroyed during the dry, drying process um yeah but uh, a lot of industries right now are utilizing microwave dried um microwave dried uh, for especially for those those big big industries um the uh, those who can produce tonnage of uh, tons of production they use microwave um, oven uh, techniques so um it it was said that uh, i'm not sure i'm not really sure about this but um this is much more relevant in terms of um cost and also um the nutrients and the nutritional profile for the bsf when, once they they dry it so um yeah so i i would i would think that um this drying process is very important because it's energy consumption and energy consumption um will lead to high costs uh, it will determine the cost of the production. So, um, yeah, but it's kind of a trade-off as well. We we don't want it to be too um, expensive to dry because uh, it will it will lead to um, expensive cost of fish feed. But we also don't want it to uh, destroy the nutrient profile of the black soldier fly. So uh, that's why I see a lot of industries result into um, microwave oven uh, techniques to dry this BSF. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the answer, doctor. Uh, I hope that we can collaborate with you some someday in. Yeah, uh, I really do hope so. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. I think um, UM University Malaya have have um. MOU with Universitas Ailanga. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's good if we can work together in the future. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Welcome. Okay, uh, thank you, Dr. Noridaya, for the nice discussion. And finally, we come to the end of the session. Thank you to all audience for your participation. Hopefully, the information that we had shared today would be useful for all. As the moderator, I would like to apologize if there were some mistakes when guiding this session. I hope you enjoyed the, the program and for Dr. Noridaya, uh, maybe we can uh, directly meet in the future. So thank you for your attention. Good, after uh, good afternoon and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much. Thank and you. I give to the uh, MC. Thank you very much to Dr. Yeah, for the very
inspiring presentation. And we would like to thank you to Mr. Faisal, who has led our discussion very well. Uh, to Dr. Anamidaya, we have a little appreciation for you. So please, the committee, to share uh, our appreciation to Dr. Anamidaya. So okay. uh, this is we can see at your screen the certificate as appreciation to you, Dr. Noridaya, for nice discussion and presentation today. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me as well. And hopefully we can meet physically, physically. Uh, and work together in the future. Okay, I hope so. Thank you. Inshallah. So thank you, Dr. Nawidaya. Before we go to the next session, we will have a documentation session. Kindly please to all participants to open your camera and give the best photo. To the committees, I would like to uh, ask you to prepare to uh, capture the screen. So maybe we can start from slide one. I will count in. Three, two, one, give your best photo. So the slide two, three, two, one. Okay, next slide three, three, two, one. Okay, slide four, three, two, one. Okay, next slide five, three, two, and one. The last slide six, three, two, one. Okay, thank you for the committees to take the picture. So, ladies and gentlemen, we now come to the end of this event. Aquaculture Case Lecture from School of Health and Natural Science 2022. And don't forget to all participants to fill up the attendance form which has been sent in Zoom chat. To all of your support in participation, we wish you best prosperity and stay healthy. So see you next time. But once again, thank you and good afternoon. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you. very much. See you again soon. Yes. Bye. -bye. See you. Yes, best what to wrong you Yes. YouTube. Terima kasih ya, semuanya. Terima kasih. Terima kasih. Terima kasih Bapak Ibu.